Hello and welcome to the CX Files for 6th of April, 2023. My name is Mark Hillary and I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm Peter Ryan, usually in Montreal, but Mark, this week I am in Tbilisi in Georgia, making a trip back to this beautiful city and amazing country with some outsourcing investors from different parts of the world. Well, always good to be traveling around and I'm certainly looking forward to getting over to the UK for your CXO event next month. Yeah, looking forward to CXO. It's going to be fantastic in Glasgow, Scotland, May 30 and 31st. And we're very fortunate today to be speaking on the pod with a gentleman who is going to be one of our keynote speakers at CX Outsourcers. Why don't you tell us who he is, Mark? Well, we're talking with Johan Stein. Um, now, Johan is a research fellow in the School of Data Science uh, and Computational Thinking at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And he's actually got a long history of working with different companies um, focused on artificial intelligence. Um, and I remember saying, I said to you, uh, we need to talk about ChatGPT on the podcast and how generational AI um, and the kind of AI systems we're seeing, even just released in the last three months or so, um, how they can influence and change CX. Uh, and you immediately said, oh, you've got to give Johan a call. So, so we had a conversation and it was actually um, just a couple of hours before we we're recording this introduction. Um, and, you know, we really sort of drilled down into how could generational AI really sort of change the game here? And I think what, what we're really sort of exploring is the self-service journey. You know, very much at the moment, if you ask a chatbot a question, uh, it will direct you to a document or an FAQ and say, here is where you can find the answer. And the sort of difference we're talking about now is being able to give you the answer immediately. You know, being able to drill into those documents pull out the right information and then create an answer that's created just for your specific question. So, so you know, there's certainly some big changes ahead. There are some massive changes ahead. And one of the things that I'm picking up on LinkedIn is the fact that uh, ChatGPT is being adopted very widely. Full disclosure, I've never actually logged on to the site. I've never actually used it. I know I'm overdue. That said, there are a lot of people that are using this in their day-to-day -day lives. They're using it in their careers. I'm also sensing, Mark, a little bit of pushback against this solution. A lot of people are wondering, is it hype? Is it is is it all talk and there's limited substance around it? The jury is still out, but we're very lucky to have somebody like Johan, who, as you say, has got just a tremendous background in the research that he does to, to provide some clarity on this. And I think give some real world views about where the applications lie in the near, the medium and the longer term. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I've seen Phil first, an uh, old friend of ours um, at um at AHFS, and he's really pushed back a lot on it, and and he's calling it the new RPA. Uh, it's it's something that everybody is talking about, but eventually it's going to prove to be useless. And I I don't think that it's it's really like this. I think that um, it is very new. It is improving rapidly. Um, and I think the the way that I would describe it is if um, let's say you search um, Google for the history of Lisbon, the city in Portugal. Um, what's it going to return to you? Maybe a hundred different websites. You know, here's you can click on here to find out about the history of Lisbon, or you can click on here, or you can click on here. Um, what ChatGPT will do is actually go to all of this information, pull out all the relevant information, and then create an essay for you. So you can actually say, write me a 500-word essay on the history of Lisbon, and it would create that for you. So I think that what you've got there it's a tool it's it's a tool yeah. that can generate information from information it's fed and so the question for all of us really is how can that change the way that customers interact with brands uh, and you know we, we went into a long discussion earlier it was 5 a.m for me so uh, it, it was a good time to get up and talk about ai well let's hear a little bit more from johan as we move to the interview Hi, Johan. It's great to get you on the podcast. And it's uh, a, obviously a very interesting topic that I've talked to a lot of people about recently. Um, 
Now, you are the founder of AIforbusiness.net and a research fellow with Stellenbosch University. Maybe um, you could just introduce your role first, you know, just to to let the listeners know, um, you know, who you are and and what kind of research you do in this area. Mark, thank you. I listened to some of your other podcasts. They're really great. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, my, my background really is in management consulting, so I've worked for firms like Accenture and PwC, uh, especially in the AI and automation space. Uh, a year ago, I started my own business, um, so I still do management consulting, especially strategy work around implementing this technology within large corporates. I'm involved with uh, four different universities um, as a adjunct professor with one, and as you said, research fellow with Stellenbosch. And then I just do a lot of speaking and content creation and writing. So I'm really passionate about this technology. My my lens is not a technical one. It's a business impact and especially a societal impact lens that I focus on, which is the ethics and the philosophy of this technology. Okay. And I really wanted to ask you about generative AI systems. I mean, particularly since chat GPT came out at the end of 2022. Uh, since then, we've seen Google launching BARD. We've seen Microsoft integrating chat GPT into their Bing search engine. So, so it seems like in the last three months or so, everybody is talking about this. But but maybe, maybe you could just summarize what, what is generative AI? Because um, I talk to a lot of my clients and, and they still haven't used it and they still don't understand it. Generative AI has been around for quite a while. Um, there's been, especially from a large language model point of view, you know, the, the largest language model prior to ChatGPT had about 13 billion perimeters. Now, perimeters essentially for me, it's the, the reach that the algorithms have to get data from the internet and to accurately answer questions So 13 billion and then open ai released chat gpt and that was 175 billion perimeters and gpt4 which i've already been playing with uh, is about a trillion perimeters so uh, in i would say in layman's terms as the word uh, would allude to it's the ability for algorithms to generate uh, content videos slides uh, articles and the like um, I often say it's the first time in human history that we who are creators, we create business cases, books, poems, songs. It's the first time that we have created something that can also create by itself. And, and that then leads the conversation to how powerful is this technology going? Are we heading toward artificial general, uh, general intelligence? What about human jobs? If I'm a musician or a poet, will I still have jobs? But I think that the basic definition for me, it's the ability for algorithms to use massive data sets and to create content according to the prompts and the requests you give it. And that's interesting then, because uh, one of the traditional ways of um, brands offering self-service to customers is to point them to FAQs, you know, the frequently asked questions. Um, and, and, you know, this has always been a, a nightmare, really. It's, you know, you've got a problem, you ask a question, and you just get pointed to a document that full of different answers. Um, I mean, it, could this sort of generative system actually use the, the data that's in there to, to create a bespoke answer for, for each customer? It's a great question, uh, Mark, and, and because that's one of the use cases in businesses, I think, because if you think of searching, if you Google something or whichever search engine you use, you don't really get the answer you're looking for. You get the most probable websites where you can find the answer. But you still have to go through those websites. And, and this has led to this search war between uh, Google and Microsoft, who have a, a very large stake in OpenAI's chat GPT. Um, and if you've played with the, the Bing um, browser from Microsoft, they now offer you the ability to, on the one hand, you will still get your typical search results, but then the chat GPT platform will actually try to answer your question. So if you say, what will the weather be like tomorrow? You would typically get a weather.com and something else. But now chat GPT can say, knowing your location, it'll be cloudy and 32 degrees or, or whatever. Um, most chatbots today are still what I call glorified FAQ pages. It doesn't really answer your question. It most likely just points you to a internal site. You know, if you ask 
um, a restaurant, for instance, what time do you open tomorrow? It'll, sh it'll take you to the opening hours page. Um, but if you say, are you open on every public holiday in April? It will still just point you to that same page. It doesn't really answer your question. I think a huge uh, use case is your internal knowledge base, especially for large firms. You know, if you want to look at what are the leave policies, you know, I might have to apply for paternity leave in October. Um, and then it will give you all these links. We have to go through all these policies. It's a lot of reading. It still doesn't give you an answer. But imagine it could, this kind of technology from an internal use point of view can find all the various data sets within the business and actually answer your question. So if I ask my local company or wherever I work, their GTP um, relevant technology, um, I want to go on paternity leave in October. And then it can come up and say, um, the paternity leave policy is five days for, for men. And uh, in October, um, you will by that time have X amount of other leave days build up that you can utilize. But remember, October 2nd and 3rd are public holidays. Also remember, you've been booked on a project for client XYZ during that time, so you need to get extra permission. So now it's pulling all the various data sets in the business to actually answer my question. So I think from a contact center point of view, from a chatbot point of view, if companies have the right kind of data on their clients, they can use this technology to really answer questions, do upselling, uh, understand clients better rather than just essentially giving us homework by giving us the links that we need to read at. So, so I think the possibilities for this technology in business, in government even, is immense. And we normally work on the like the 80-20 sort of rule that, you know, we 80% um, of the sort of interactions are based on 20, uh, like a subset of um, a small subset of questions, the 20%. The um, so it seems that that we could almost eliminate that that 80 percent um, if we have all of the documentation around a product, for example, um, and, and a generative AI on top of that, then um, we don't need the sort of human experts because the, the, the AI would be able to answer almost any question based on what it already knows about that product. I mean, is that the case? Absolutely. I, I think 80% or more of questions asked uh, for a chatbot or for a contact center agent are very low value, repetitive kind of thing. So it could be that, what are your opening hours? Or how do I change my email address? Or how do I submit an insurance claim? And, and if you think of, I mean, I've myself worked in a contact center before. It is a horrible job and a boring job to answer the same questions over and over and over. So, and this is where I think this technology can do the heavy lifting. Um, and I often speak about taking the robot out of the human, because if you have a job which is fairly low value, fairly administrative, repetitive, you are in a way already a robot. You're working like a robot. So let the robots do that work, that typical um, uh, bulk of the questions most clients will ask. But then use humans with intuition, with experience, with empathy, with problem solving skills to rather answer the higher value kind of questions. An example, I mean, I recently phoned my mobile phone provider because I, I had to change my email address for, from a billing point of view. And I spoke to one of the best contact center agents I've ever spoken with. She was friendly. She was informed. She, uh, there was empathy. And I'm thinking, are you using this great person to answer questions about changing my email address? Let the robots do that. But this kind of quality contact center agent should answer a call with very high value clients, angry clients, frustrated clients, because she clearly had the ability to calm you down, take you on this journey. So I think let, again, let the robots do what they do best and the stuff they are good at, they are very good at. But the stuff that you can't automate, experience, empathy, intuition, et cetera. So I think businesses have to look at this. Um, the other question is why do we get so many inquiries about X topic. It could be that the information is not available on our site. And one example I want to use, I work with one of our large uh, medical aid administrators here in Johannesburg, and they receive about half a million calls, incoming calls a month. And the bulk of those calls are topics that clients should have known. And then what we realized, because the initial ask was, we need better chatbots, we need more AI, but it's actually that information that the client gets when they sign up 
and and also on a really helpful website that that could have and eventually did alleviate about 40 percent of those calls because the clients already know so rather than jump on let's use ai to fix everything there's some fundamental architecture flows in your business the way you work with your clients that should solve the problem way before you even look at ai kind of technology yeah 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 and, and it seems that uh, we've had these kind of chatbots available for a long time that that can answer simple questions you know like wh- where is my package this kind of thing um but but like you're saying normally the answer is to point you to a page of information and say go there the answer is there if you read that document but but now you sort of being able to bespoke create an actual answer um, from the information available. Um, so it seems that if the self-service can become so much more powerful, then um, we may not need as many people working in customer service. And the, and the problem that immediately jumps out for me is that almost everybody in this industry charges by the person in the contact center. You know, it's always the full-time equivalent, the FTE. Uh, we've got a contact center with 200 people to answer this volume of calls. Um, but what if 80% of that volume can be handled by the robots? Then suddenly the business model is, is entirely different. So instead of FTE charging, we would need to charge by customer satisfaction or some, some other metric or measure. Um, I mean, is, is that something that you're also seeing j- jumping out from this? I do think, look, in my experience, most contact centers are not nearly as digitized as they would like people to think. Uh, They are exactly on that FTE model, like you said, Mark. But what if they can move to an outcome model, a problem having been sold or a customer satisfaction model? Um, I th- look, of course, the big question then is what do we do with all the people? And that is a very difficult conversation. You know, it's so easy to say we're just going to upskill everyone. We're going to let people do higher value tasks, etc. But some people actually like doing low level repetitive work. And we need those worker bees. You know, there are people they want to work eight to five. They know they're going to do five reports a day. You're not going to upskill them to become a manager or etc. So it is a my consulting to or advice to clients is do you really have an accurate view of the skill sets and ambitions in your workforce? Because with, and it's more an organizational design question than an AI question. Because how will this technology impact your people? And and there's also the ethical consideration of what do you um, do with a lot of people who are the single um, income uh, generators in a household or even in a family. I mean, here in South Africa, on average, um, each wage earner looks after five or six extended family members. So to get rid of 10 people impacts a lot more people. And then it's that balance because you are running a business, you have shareholders, you have to bring your costs down. So I'm not suggesting people should live in a, call it a kumbaya land, we're just going to love everyone, no one's going to lose their jobs. But at least business owners should grapple with this. Maybe, and, and I've often seen this, and I'm sure you have, you sometimes have real wonderful stars in a team, but they've never been given the opportunity. They just answer calls every day. So again, it's putting in that effort because you might just have one of the best employees hidden there in the dark terraces of the call center. But but just to answer your question, the the probability and possibility of replacing replacing a lot of the things we do as humans is absolutely there. And again, how do you then balance the ethics and the value of people with business and shareholders and returns? It's a very difficult thing to figure out. It should never be easy. It should be a difficult thing that people grapple with before they make those. You can't just make a spreadsheet decision on who you're going to get rid of, which is often the case, I think. Yeah, yeah. But that, that kind of comes back to what you were saying before about, you know, you called your phone company and you actually had a great interaction with somebody, even though all you were doing was changing your email address. And, um, you know, there you, you see that, um, well, it comes back to the, the 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 way that the AI model is trained because it can only know what it knows. It only knows what, from um, the information that it's been fed. And so where there's a novel 
new type of problem or something unusual, then clearly you need a human to to uh, to be able to to handle the problem. So so you, you're always going to have that I don't know 10, 20, 30 percent of interactions that that actually need a person. But 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 what we're kind of saying is it's becoming much easier to automate. Uh, majority of transactions. Yeah. Think of if, say, your bank account has been hacked. Tomorrow morning you log in to your internet banking and there's nothing. I don't want to speak to a chatbot. I don't want to speak to a contact center agent. I want to drive to my local branch and I want to see the manager and I don't want to leave until they fix it. Because this is a hugely inconvenient problem. It's not just um, I want to change my password and I don't speak to a very efficient uh, contact center agent. Healthcare, and, and for me, I think your finances and the health, your health and your family's health, those two topics are closer to home than anything else. If if my son, he is nine, if he's got a, a very high fever and I need to get him to the hospital or a doctor, I don't want an automated decisioning system to decide when I can take him. Because there could be biases in there just because of my gender, my ethnicity, because I live on the wrong side of the tracks in my city. It, it could um, actually say, I can only go in in four hours. I want to get in my car right now and I want to speak with a human. So I think that human to human element, I cannot see technology completely removing it ever. We are just hardwired for, for connection, for, for fit, for empathy. But all these other things, let's automate that. Let's alleviate humans from those kind of jobs. Let's make our customers happier. Uh, I think a, a, a change I'm seeing in the chatbot world is more contextual data. Because if I ask a normal chatbot, it normally won't have an idea who I am. I'm just somebody on the website. Even if I'm logged in to my bank, and I recently with my own bank, I, I saw a transaction that I wanted to query, and it gave me the option to speak to an agent on the chatbot text. But they had, I've, now I've already been logged in. I did biometrics, everything. They still ask me who I am. What is my query? They ask me questions on data they should have. In fact, they should most likely already know why I'm contacting them by the time I contact them. Here are the four probabilities of why this customer, and it has to do with the time of the month. If it's the end of the month, it could often be um, balancing queries. Hopefully your salary has been paid in. You want to query uh, debit orders, for instance. Um, there's an insurance company in, I think, in China, if I remember correctly, that can, if I remember the facts, they can, with an 85% probability, predict which customers will contact them on which days, at what time, and with what inquiry, based on all the data. So imagine how we can empower contact center agents when, if I receive the call, the most likely question and answer is already on my screen. How, how great would that job be? So we no longer have an excuse to use stupid chatbots, uh, non-contextual chatbots. I mean, the technology is there. It's fairly cost-effective to utilize. I wonder if at some stage we're not going to have more of an uprising from clients to say we will not take this level of service anymore. I will lead that uprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've seen exactly the same situation myself recently with uh, my my pet food order. You know, I have a, a regularly recurring pet food order, and I had a problem with it recently. And even though I was signed into the app for the for the the pet food brand um when i clicked on chat to us about a problem uh, then it asked me for everything like what's your phone number what's your name what's your social security number and and e even though i was signed into the app and th that level of uh service just seems awful today yeah. i think they, they should obviously at least be a very fundamentally simple security check but then it should actually just confirm, like you've, you've typically ordered this product on Thursdays every week. Um, we see no order this week, so maybe we've missed it. And just to double check, your address is X and you normally like us to deliver at 4 p.m. Rather than you telling them that because they should already know that. You know, another example, back to the restaurant. If I ask the restaurant, um, are you open on public holidays? Uh, they will, as I said, the simple chatbot will take me to the opening hours page. But what if it can say, hi, Mr. Stein, we see you typically on Thursdays come in for breakfast around 8 a.m. and you order eggs Benedict. We are open this Thursday. In fact, would you like us to already make that meal ready for you by the time you arrive at 8 o'clock? That's conversational AI. That's not a chatbot. You know, and imagine the application in, in banking, financial services, and healthcare that 
contextual data. You know, you contact your hospital or your doctor and, and the AI picks up that you are on certain uh, terminal medicine, but you haven't received your medicine this week. Um, and the first question it says, when can we dispatch it? Do you still want that medicine? So almost one of the problems is we sometimes struggle to explain what we're struggling with. We would often explain the consequences or the symptoms. Uh, so for instance, I will tell my internet service provider that my internet is down. I can't give them more information. I just can't use the internet. Um, they should then know whether there's an outage in my area on a local switch, um, whether there's an electricity outage, et cetera. But we should help people through, and this is, I think, where generative AI, text-to-speech kind of technology can really help, is to better understand through sentiment analysis, through certain keywords being used, what the client is actually trying to explain, even though they are struggling. And then it can maybe just come back with a verification message. It seems that you're actually struggling with this. And then the client can say, that is exactly it. I just didn't know how to word it. Mm. There, this technology can play a big role in all industries, I think. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Um, I mean, that conversational aspect of the, the relationship between the brand and the customer. And, and I think that that comes to something that I've talked about a lot recently with different clients is um, customer lifetime value. And, you know, instead of just focusing on the individual call or the individual transaction or the problem the customer has right now, it, it's like thinking about, well, how do we relate to that customer for the next 40 years? You know, imagine if you're a Chevrolet or, you know, a car brand, uh, we don't just want to sell you a car today. We want to make sure we sell you a car. And then in three years, you come back and buy another one. And, and so it's, so it's that kind of long-term relationship. And I was thinking that, you know, any brand that has a long history, uh, you should be able to sort of feed the autobiography of the founder uh, into the, the AI model and any documents about any product they've ever released uh, and then create a bot that you could chat to about the history of the company. I mean, do you think that, let's say a company like Virgin, for example, I could feed it all the books that Richard Branson has written, um, plus documents about everything they've ever done as a company. Uh, and then I could have a chatbot called Sir Richard that I could chat to about the history of the company. I mean, do, does that sound crazy or is, or do you think that, that that would even be feasible? Look, it's an interesting uh, prospect. Look, in the case of Virgin and, and, and you know, even Apple, et cetera, I think we relate more to that founder than the brand itself. Um, and then other instances, you don't really care where the founder was. It's maybe a strong brand, but it doesn't really matter. But imagine the chatbot could emulate the voice of Richard Branson and his mannerisms and the way he speaks. That it, even though you know it's not him, but when I speak to this conversational AI, it's like I'm speaking to Sir Richard. Um, and his his values, his ethics, the the things that he's um, uh, passionate about comes through in the conversation. I would love that. And even and while doing that, we're solving my problem. And then while we're chatting, the email has changed and the password, etc. Um, it, it also brings us, I think, to the topic of hyper-personalization. If you think of customer lifecycle value, um, because I there's a lot of products and services that my providers can offer me that I just didn't know they do, or I didn't know I might need. But if they have enough data on me and they can look at the um, my behavior, it's really almost a behavioral science conversation on top of AI. If they know I would, so for instance, my mobile provider, um, you know, most mobile providers harvest about eight to 900 data points on every client from your geospatial location, who else you relate with or associate with that's on their network if you're on certain proximity. They know which shopping centers you go to. They can see your transactional transactions or your financial transactions through the text messages you get when you swipe your card. Um, they see what applications you use. They see what time you use your phone. And I did a, a POC with one of our local providers where, um, and, and a lot of these mobile providers are actually banks. They're becoming banks and financial service providers. But we looked at um, females of all of the typical uh, childbearing years. We just used the numbers, say, 18 to 35. Um, and we also focused on certain geographies within the country. And then we looked at their behavior. So and what we found, and, and none of these single data points are necessarily accurate, but if you build a model, it can use all the data points. So what we did find is if a female of that age on their network 
randomly suddenly start using her phone later at night, early in the morning, during the night, and she's never done it before. One of the possibilities is there's a new baby, and she might, might be doing feeding while checking her social media feed. But then also, if she suddenly starts looking at nappies, milk, and so forth, there's a, and if you take all of this data together, you can predict the, the behavior. And then what do you do with that data? And obviously, yeah, you have to tread carefully from a privacy point of view and an ethics point of view. But what if you can then offer that customer potential services? It could be a, a insurance for the child. It could be a educational you know, investment for them. Or it, it, could, it could just be a healthcare advice if you want it. That's just one example. But if we you hyper-personalize to our clients, if we offer them services, they would have loved to buy if they only knew they would need it. And, and I think, again, we don't have an excuse these days not to do it anymore. Maybe just to conclude on this one, uh, Mark, I'm working with a client or sorry, with a company, Silicon Valley based, but they're, they're here in Cape Town. And they work with banks. Um, and it's almost like Netflix. Netflix is the best example on hyper-personalization. You know, every time... I go onto Netflix, depending on the time of day and what I watched previously, the landing cards or the pictures of the series and movies will change their background and their picture. They've got, I think, up to three or 400 different pictures for each title. But on this mobile phone app that they've helped the bank with, the sticking with corporate branding, but you still, they know, Johan will most likely respond to a red background better. I will most likely respond to a top left menu button. And because they can predict why I'm going onto the app, the most probable um, topics will be on the drop down, and then I can expand it. But rather than looking at 30 items on the drop down, it'll most likely be those three, um, at, and so forth. So there's so much if you just have enough data that you can predict and hyper personalize. And then we put on top of that uh, generative AI, and the world goes open for so many opportunities, I think. Yeah, yeah, and and I wanted to ask about putting uh, machine learning on top of that as well, then, because it would seem that, on the surface, it would seem that if uh, the system encounters a new situation and then there is a resolution to that, then it could learn. So then that learning would then apply across all customers in future with that problem. But um, it, 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 there's lots of examples of um, horror stories with machine learning where, where bots have been almost trained. It, it's really about bad actors. You know, it's people that have fun with the bots and train them to be racist or something. Um, I mean, how, how do you sort of prevent that? Because I know that the open AI, that the, they specifically didn't allow chat GPT to be trained by the users um, for, for this sort of reason. So, so how, how do you sort of allow the system to learn, but to not be influenced by people who just want to have fun with it? It's a good question, Mark. And I think this is where the human in the loop comes in. We need to train these models. We, I don't think we can autonomize them learning. So if there's an outlier situation in a contact center environment, the, the AI didn't know how to answer this. It's the first time somebody in that manner or language or with that topic contacted them. You should immediately bring a, a, a senior enough human in to resolve the issue, but then that human should work with the designers of the system to say, it's almost like we dictate going forward based on our human ethics and values and our experience, how the model should respond. But I think it's if we just let the models te keep on teaching themselves, that's when this chaos can happen. Um, yeah, so humans are there in the loop. Uh, we Because what you should train the model is how did the human fix that problem? If it's, an, if it's something we've accounted for the first time and how can and accurately fix that problem? And then what are the steps for the model to emulate the, call it the decision tree or whatever to resolve that issue? So yeah, you, uh, you can't just let, I think, these platforms loose to, to keep on learning by themselves. Because it'll it'll be chaotic. Yeah, yeah, and and you probably saw that the the day before we had this conversation. Now um, I put out a call on social media just to see if anybody had any questions. And and I actually got a message from Bill Thompson, who's the he's one of the presenters on BBC's Digital Planet show. So uh, well well qualified to ask, but but he he wanted to ask. I mean, how do we avoid? this sort of seduction of thinking that there's really a mind in, in the AI itself um, so that we can plan solutions for business using this as a tool rather than thinking 
it's intelligent um, because I think that you know, as humans, we always love to give agency to, to systems, uh, but we don't do that if we've just got a, like a hammer and a nail, you know, that it's just a hammer. So, so, so how do we sort of avoid that with, with AI? It is a big problem, Mark, because I mean, we tend to anthropomorphize things we don't understand. We've done it for thousands of years, you know, in Mesopotamia, they dig up these little fertility god statues, et cetera. You know, so back back then and today still, depending on your religious outlook, people will talk about the face of God or the eyes of God. It's, it's anthropomorphification. We do it with our pets as well. We do it with AI as well. Why? If you Google search, image search AI or robots, it will almost look anthropomorphic. It'll have a little face, it'll have ears, it'll have eyes, it'll look, hopefully will look friendly. Um, there's an article I wrote a few weeks back about the, um, the importance of the images we put out there on AI, um, because most AI images are of male Caucasian looking robots, if you Google it. And, and where I realized this, my, my son is adopted, so he's, a, he's of African descent, he's nine now, and we had to do a school um, uh, uh, test or something, or, a, or a, we had to write an article on the topic are robots my friends? And I said to him, okay, let's, we were looking for an image. So I'm Caucasian, he's African. And then after a while he said to me, daddy, why do all these robots look like you and not like me? And that really, really landed for me. So I think it's these, the narratives we tell about this technology and Hollywood is to blame here as well. If you, most people still fear it, I think it's the end of the world. It's, you know, it's gonna be a war of the worlds kind of scenario. But it's a it's a demystifying. It's explaining that it's these are essentially algorithms. You can't make them personal, anthropomorphize them. They they're not sentient. Although I think we'll get there in the next fifty years, maybe. But that's a whole other conversation over scotch. But um and and also it is still even though it is the most powerful technology we've ever created, it is surprisingly inefficient and not that powerful and flawed. And I think that's the message. You know, it's not a silver bullet. It's not just plug in AI to fix my business. It will not fix the things that only human can fix. So again, back to, for me, always the things you can't automate is sort of toxic leadership, people who don't understand their jobs, people who fear for their jobs, uh, narcissism in the business and so forth, or even just common sense. You can't automate those things. And my experience with a lot of large corporates is that they try and silver bullet this AI thing and just fix everything. And then it is normally a huge mess, you know. So hopefully that answers the question. But I think it's because we think of it almost in a mythical way that we tend to think it can just do things that it never or for now can't do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, and just like you're saying, uh, we don't get enough common sense from our, from our politicians and they're, yes. they're human. So, so how can we expect it from AI? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, okay, so I mean, just to wrap up, then I, you know, we've seen this crazy sort of three months or so since Chat GPT came out, um, and it seemed to be a quantum leap, and and it's certainly been that for the public uh, knowledge or public imagination around AI, because you know now so many millions of people have experienced this, whereas before it was kind of left for the the AI and the IT sort of people. Um, but how far do you think this can go in the next couple of years? Now that the sort of touch paper has been lit, what, what, what do you see as possible use cases that we might see in the near future? So definitely, Mark, I think this last few months have moved it from the typical techy, geeky kind of domain to mainstream conversations. I mean, I haven't seen a publication, a news outlet, a TV station that hasn't repeatedly spoken about ChatGPT. So it's a good thing, I think. Where will the future go? So will we reach, what we, so currently we are at what we call artificial narrow intelligence. It can emulate aspects of human intelligence, but with limits. Will we get to artificial general intelligence where it is as smart as or smarter as humans? And then, of course, the question is super intelligence, um, which is really the doomsday scenario. Uh, and yeah, I think one has to look at the philosophers, and I'm very pleased that some of the main voices on AI are not technical people. They are historians and philosophers. Nick Bostrom uh, from Oxford, his book, Super Intelligence, worth a read. The various books of Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens, um, et cetera, because he, he, they are using philosophy to try and see, because I don't think you can just use the potential technical expansion to determine the future. We have to think of, of it philosoph from a philosophical point of view. Here's the question, and Bostrom touches on this. 
you know, depending on, on one's view of history and evolutionary history, you know, about, say, 50 or so thousand of years ago, Homo sapiens, for some reason or another, got the upper hand over Neanderthals that we were cohabitating the, the planet with. Uh, we don't, I don't think there are any Neanderthals left, although we all have some genetic material of them in us. We are now at a pivot again where a new species are being created. The difference is it's not evolutionary. We are creating it. And what is that next species? That is the, the android person where um, it's not just that parts of your body is replaced with technology. We've already seen that with people who have lost their legs, for instance, and so forth. But the, this brain-computer interface where Neuralink, or again, Elon Musk and others are playing, will, and, and it brings you to the question of consciousness. What is it to be conscious? And will an implant in my brain make me more conscious? Will I become a superhuman? And here we go to, to Nietzsche's Ubermensch conversation. But I think where we're going to go, and the philosophers are talking about this, is in the next few years, we are going to create a human-like somewhat human super being and will they do to us what we what we did to neanderthals thousands of years ago manipulate essentially make us extinct and that is a dark uh, dystopian picture and then we can bring all in here as well but i the more i study this technology and i'm very passionate and positive about it but i think maybe in our lifetimes or definitely in lifetimes of our children we will get to a place where it is it's going to overpower us and I know that's yeah. not exciting to hear, but I think we need to talk about these things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think maybe at a practical level, uh, because we're already seeing self-driving autonomous vehicles being delivered to, to users. Do you think that eventually, or maybe even in the very near future, that we will see an option uh, in an emergency situation? Do you want me to take control uh, or should I allow you as the human to take control of the emergency? And, and that, that is a sort of philosophical question, isn't it? Look, I think any system we create that's totally out of human control is dangerous uh, because it will make mistakes. There are biases in the data, no matter how much we try and eliminate it. Uh, but I would want to call it a kill switch. I want to, so imagine everything, because we are getting to a point where more and more devices in our homes are smart devices. Your fridge can reorder and supplies and the heating goes on, et cetera, et cetera. But what if something goes wrong and a fire starts, but you don't have the ability to, um, for the fire alarm to go off or for the sprinkler system, for instance, because it's been automated. That's one example. The same in a self-driving car. I would never want to drive in a car where I cannot, when I want to, take control. Uh, now, imagine this same thing in, in healthcare and in financial services. I, for instance, think that we look more and more when we call contact centers, we are speaking to some sort of an AI, some way or another. But I think, and this, the problem we have is globally, there is very little legislation on this topic. There's a lot of privacy legislation, but not on ethical AI and data use. I think ethically, I should be told that you are about to speak to Bob, the AI, who is very going to be very good in helping you. But if at any time you want to speak to a human, press hash. I think that should be an option. Um, no, the moment we don't have control, whether it's simple little devices, whether it's running our homes and our offices or running our military, imagine imagine an AI can give commanders instructions on who to bomb. So we should never, even though we are flawed or we make mistakes, we should never, ever have humans out of this loop because then, it's, then we are heading to doomsday, I think. Well, on that note, um, heading to doomsday, <laughs> maybe we should wrap up for, for this conversation. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week. I did a whole book of poetry about for my daughter. <laughs>